Uh, my name is Heather Boucher. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Economist here at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. And it is my um, honor and privilege to be able to welcome you here to our first public event in our new space here at the um, Center for Equitable Growth. Um, so I didn't even know that we could play soft jazz while we're waiting for folks to come in. So that's pretty exciting. Um, we are so um, honored to be able to co-host this event with the Economic Policy Institute to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Myth and Measurement, the new economics of the minimum wage. Um, you know, here at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, we focus on understanding whether and how inequality affects economic growth and stability. Essentially, um, the kinds of policy questions and economic research questions that um, Alan Kruger and David Card investigated in this book. Um, I want to quote um, from the preface of the book, just, just a sentence that I think sort of sums up why we were so excited to host this today. They note um, in their section near the end about the next 20 years, that um, the fact that there is still interest in myth and measurement, the new economics of the minimum wage, 20 years after it was first published, is testament to the enduring power that transparent and well-designed research can have on economics research and public policy. Um, I'd like to underscore that twice and bold it, um, that that is um, certainly my experience here in Washington, that that kind of research really can make a difference and um, that this kind of, of work uh, really has made a difference. Um, this book, uh, Myth and Measurement, challenged the conventional economic theory and perceived wisdom about minimum wages. And it demonstrated the power of using transparent <laughs> empirical approaches both to study the effects of policies and to inform more deeply our understanding of how labor markets function. Um, I want to note that I first encountered this research, and I don't want to make you over there <coughs> feel old or anything, um, but uh, I first encountered these papers as I was studying for my qualifying exams in labor economics. And of course, at that point, the book actually wasn't out yet, but the papers that led to it were. And at the time, I remember my professor, David Gordon, sort of underscoring that this was the most important new research in labor economics, and this was where the field was headed. And I can say 20 years later that I think we were right about that. And um, it's just been very exciting to watch how the, the field around um, the minimum wage, but also the larger questions that they asked, grow in the decades since. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our esteemed panel uh, this morning. Um, Alan Kruger is the Bentheim Professor of Economics and Public Affairs at Princeton University and is the founding director of the Princeton University Survey Research Center. Um, I uh, got to know Alan over the past few years, uh, uh, mostly because he has been a leader here in Washington in policy. Uh, first um, with his stint as chief economist at the US Department of Labor, then at the US Department of Treasury in the early years of the Obama administration, and of course, most recently and most importantly, as the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors from 2011 to 2013. Um, I just want to underscore for those of us here in DC that are looking to the research community and to academics to help inform policy making that Alan has been a role model and I know improved the kinds of work that the Obama administration has done. And um, for that, uh, uh, I salute you and, and thank you so much for your service. Um, David Card is the class of 1950 professor of economics at the University of California, Berkeley and director of the Labor Studies Program at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He also has a very long vita of impressive accomplishments, among them um, that in 1985 he received the American Economic Association's John Bates Clark Prize, um, which is awarded every other year at the time to the best economist under 40. Um, it is a real honor to have David here in Washington today. Um, I have not been able to hear him, to, well, actually at the AAs, we did hear him talk a little bit about the minimum wage, but I have not been able to hear him talk about this book or this work before, and we're so excited to have him. One question that I really hope that we can talk about today in the panel is um, his experiences as someone who's been in academia, how this research that is so important for labor economics but also for policy is sort of taken from the academic research into the policy landscape and what he's learned, maybe some do's and don'ts about how to do that well and what we could learn about that. I would be eager to hear, so hopefully we can get to that. 
And then, of course, um, third is Larry Michelle, who is president of the Economic Policy Institute, our co-host of this event today. And um, I will note that my first job um, here in Washington, D.C. was working at EPI, a stint that um, I'm very proud of and very happy to have been a part of this fantastic organization. Um, it's also where uh, I learned a couple of key facts about the U.S. economy that I will end with before I hand it over to, to Alan, um, which is that Larry spent a lifetime talking to us about how uh, the United States has gotten richer and richer each year, but American workers haven't gained from that economic growth. We've seen this growing gap um, over the past few decades between uh, wages and productivity. And this research on the minimum wage and what policymakers can do um, to address that gap, I think could not be um, more important, but it's also a testament to the focus that EPI has had on these sets of issues. So without further ado, um, I'd like to invite Alan to, to come on up. Thanks, Heather, for that very generous introduction. And I want to thank the Center for Equitable Growth and EPI for uh, hosting this event. Uh, and David and I really do appreciate that uh, you're holding this event. The only event that was held for the first edition that I recall was actually at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh. <laughs> and uh, David will recall, and we cite this in the new preface, that the most memorable comment we received there was, one economist in the audience who subsequently held a very important government job said, wait a minute, theory is evidence too. <laughs> what do you mean there's no evidence for the conventional model? And no one there kind of reacted to that, to, to that comment, which surprised <laughs> us. Um, and one of the reasons why we were really eager to participate today is uh, there was something of an organized effort, I would say, to um, suppress a lot of the work in the book and to kind of isolate it. And the reason why we wrote Myth and Measurement, The New Economics of the Minimum Wage, was not to talk just about New Jersey versus Pennsylvania, but was to incorporate many other anomalies that we were finding. The fact that if you look at the uncovered sector, employers who are not covered by the minimum wage, they still, in many cases, seem to abide by it. You see a large spike in the wage distribution at the minimum wage, and it actually moves up when the minimum wage rises. And that's not something that one would expect from the conventional model. In fact, you would expect wages to fall in the uncovered sector uh, when the minimum wage rises. And we thought in our book we painted a fairly broad collage, not only comparing New Jersey and Pennsylvania, but looking within New Jersey, uh, updating David's work on uh, California's minimum wage increase, uh, looking across states, uh, looking internationally. Um, and one of the reasons why we wanted to reissue the book is we think that the whole picture is important, not just the uh, New Jersey-Pennsylvania uh, uh, comparison. And uh, every time I read from the other EPI uh, that this work has been discredited, <laughs> it makes me wonder why do they have to say it's discredited every time? If it was discredited long ago, I don't think people would still uh, still be citing it, it would be necessary for them to say it's been discredited. Um, so I don't think their effort succeeded. Um, I was asked to talk about the impact of uh, our work on public policy and on the public debate. Uh, and uh, David can talk more about the uh, research impact, which is a little bit backwards in Washington. Uh, uh, maybe you talk about the policy impact before the research impact. Uh, but I think that the impact on uh, the public debate and on policy has been profound. You can see some indications of this just by looking at op-eds or editorials in the New York Times. Uh, this audience is probably too young to remember, but in 1987, the New York Times opposed increasing the minimum wage uh, and uh, was concerned that raising the minimum wage then to $4.35 an hour would uh, cause unemployment to rise. Um, just uh, a few weeks ago, the New York Times criticized Hillary Clinton because she supported raising the minimum wage to $12 an hour, not 15 So they've turned uh, quite a bit. There was a bipartisan uh, group that was assembled by AEI and Brookings, which came out with a consensus report which endorsed raising the minimum wage. Uh, so I think there have been fairly significant changes 
in the, in the public uh, discussion. And I think the reason is because our methods were pretty simple, they were clear, and I think the comparisons that we were making were compelling. Uh, Richard Friedman said that this is the only study you could explain to your uncle. <laughs> and I think that that did lead the work to get more attention. Um, and because it influenced the economics profession and received attention in the press, it influenced public policy and politicians. In the State of the Union address in 1995, President Clinton said, now I've studied the arguments for and against the minimum wage increase. I believe the weight of the evidence is that a modest minimum wage increase does not cost jobs and may even lure people back to the job market. Which is a pretty succinct way, I think, of explaining um, uh, what we wanted to emphasize, which is that there are labor supply effects uh, of the minimum wage. Um, President George W. Bush signed the minimum wage increase. Um, but in many respects, 2016 is like it was the case when we published the book in 1995. The minimum wage has not increased for seven years. That's the third longest stretch without a minimum wage increase. And what we're seeing now is what we were seeing at that time, which is many of the states are raising their own minimum wages. Half of the states have increased their minimum wages above the federal level. Uh, many cities have been raising their minimum wages. The minimum wage continues to be very popular among the public. Uh, in referendums, it passed in Alaska, Arkansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota, uh, not necessarily blue states, in 2014. Um, and if you look at public opinion polling, the minimum wage is supported by a broad segment of the population. It appeals to lower income people more than higher income people, but even a majority of higher income earners uh, support a higher minimum wage across parties. Uh, surveys of business owners find uh, that they support uh, having a minimum wage. Uh, I've also been struck in something which I don't think either of us anticipated is that our work would have an impact on policy outside of the U.S. And really most profoundly in the U.K. there was a dramatic turnaround. In 1993 the U.K. got rid of wage councils which were essentially industry-based minimum wages. Um, and then in 1999 they did a U-turn and they imposed a national minimum wage. And they did this in, I think, a very thoughtful way. They appointed a low pay commission, a group with representatives from academia, from business, from labor, to make recommendations. They recommended having a national minimum wage. They did research on what impact uh, the minimum wage has had in the UK. Research uh, has found that abolishing the wage councils did not lead to job growth, as one would have expected from standard economic theory. Um, and the minimum wage in the UK is currently around the equivalent of $10 an hour in the US. Uh, and in a remarkable turnaround, David Cameron, uh, the Tory leader, has supported raising the minimum wage well above what the Low Pay Commission has proposed. Um, so it shows that uh, politics can, can change. Then the other place which has been remarkable and should generate research in the future is Germany which has a minimum wage of eight and a half euros, or about $9.50 an hour. And that started in January 2015. Um, so uh, I think we've seen remarkable movement. And you see this in uh, polls of the economics profession as well. Um, while opinions have changed, the minimum wage continues to be contentious in the US. Uh, I think our main conclusion that the minimum wage mainly has a distributional effect uh, on the economy, affects the slice of the pie, the size of the slice of the pie uh, that workers receive rather than the total size of the pie is held up uh, rather well. And in that type of environment, it makes sense that you've got different interest groups which will uh, fight over minimum wage, but I think our work has led to a more honest discussion uh, of what the arguments can be. Um, I would conclude by saying that one area where I don't think we've seen enough change is in the way that policymakers and others think about the labor market. I think fundamentally what myth and measurement has done is to raise the question of how competitive is the job market. Should we view the job market as competitive or should we think of non-competitive forces? And both the left and the right when they think about problems of workers in the US blame trade and technology, 
And I think that oversimplifies what's going on. I'm probably as responsible as anyone for oversimplifying. But I think it downplays a lot of the findings that we emphasized in our book. The role of institutions, the role of norms, norms about fairness, the impact of policies such as the minimum wage and other policies on uh, workers, market power, whether employers have monopsony power over workers because of frictions and non-competitive factors in the job market, the role of bargaining power, uh, and the role of co collusion across uh, employers. And I think that these non-competitive aspects uh, of the labor market are very important. Uh, David's work uh, has uh, uh, persuaded me, among others, uh, that we need to pay more attention when we think about the rise in inequality uh, to these non-competitive factors. Um, so uh, I'm hoping that uh, reissuing the book will help to further that debate. Now I'm delighted to turn it over to David. Um, well, thanks for coming, uh, and um, thanks to uh, EPI and the Center for Equitable Growth for hosting this event. As Alan said, um, the reception is a little uh, warmer today than uh, I, I recall it. Uh, the AEI 20 years ago. Um, Alan has sort of mentioned, I think, a number of things that I will uh, reiterate or, or reinforce um, about how I think our work uh, in, the, in the book and prior to that has influenced the course of research in economics. Um, looking back, I, I had the chance to on a long plane flight last, last night to kind of reread the introduction, which uh, I have to say, um, uh, the, the first draft of the introduction was written by Alan, and Alan is a very good writer, and it holds up well. Um, and uh, what we were trying to do at that point was show that the, the textbook story about the minimum wage wasn't really working. And that seems like an awfully trivial point, uh, maybe in retrospect. Uh, but it, it was extremely important at the time, and I think is still important in lots of other directions. I'm going to come back and talk about it at the end of my remarks here. Um, so we were trying to basically establish that the way that people were thinking about how the minimum wage worked in the labor market was really not correct. And we, Alan pointed out the, not just the fact that when you raise the minimum wage in lots of different instances, it didn't look like employment would necessarily fall, but also issues like why were uh, workers who were earning more than the minimum wage receiving an increase when the minimum wage went up? Why were employers so reluctant to use sub-minimum wage uh, rules when those were readily available? Why was there no um, use of offset provisions, things like uh, reducing the amount that employers provided free meals in the, in the restaurant industry? Um, a really interesting one has always been to me, when we were first thinking about doing the work on the minimum wage, we walked down the street in Princeton and we noticed that virtually every little shop in Princeton had a sign up, uh, bring in, you know, a worker's needed, bring in your friends. Uh, and we actually found very strong evidence of those kind of financial incentives. So we were trying to argue that, the way I would explain this to a sort of a more technical audience is we were trying to argue that the working model uh, so e economists have an, a kind of a go-to set of ideas that they're going to use to look at any kind of problem. And in the case of the minimum wage, that working model was something that everybody was teaching their undergraduates in uh, Economics one. And we were trying to argue that that working model was not correct. And um, the key idea we were trying to get into the, that model was the idea that, in fact, employers set wages. Uh, when you go to a job, the employer sets the wage. It might be in consultation with you. You might have a little bit of bargaining power. But on average, the employer is setting the wage. And there is a, a, an element of discretion there. And that doesn't seem like a very controversial idea to me, but it does really change around uh, the way that things like the minimum wage work. And um, in the 20 years since we did our work, there's been quite an expansion of research, uh, really quite a large body of new theory that is taking that more seriously in the labor market side. Um, and uh, my sense is that, that although that has filtered through to this sort of uh, more theoretical of our colleagues, it hasn't really gotten to the policy establishment. So when people are thinking about how to think about the minimum wage, they're still going to end up going back to the economics one model. And they're still going to have uh, concepts and arguments that are focused around that uh, economics one type model. And so uh, in some sense, I think the work is still to be done in uh, convincing people uh, not just that the, 
the way they think about this is, uh, is incorrect. Now, it doesn't have to be very incorrect. The really fundamental thing, I think, is a really small change in an economic model can make a really big difference for policy prescriptions. And uh, that isn't really well understood, I think, uh, even to this day. So uh, after we'd gone through that, we tried to argue for what I would call an evidence-based policy discussion. Um, and this is something I think that Heather was mentioning at the beginning. The idea that, suppose you're trying to think about raising the minimum wage. Well, you could ask uh, your favorite economist to draw a picture and, and spend a couple hours uh, writing out a little formula. Or you could go and tr study what had happened the last 20 times the minimum wage had been raised. And you might not be able to answer every question with the evidence, but you could at least put together uh, some thoughts as to where does this increase in the minimum wage sit relative to things we've seen in the past. And I think this is an argument that is at the forefront right now talking about what level of minimum wage we might want to set today. Uh, people are going to look and say, well, where has the minimum wage got in the, in the wage distribution, say in the 70s or say in recent um, uh, state level or city level uh, episodes, and try and use that evidence to inform the discussion in combination with some careful um, thinking about uh, the ways that, um, that the putting that evidence together in a framework. Um, and I just want to end by saying that I think that uh, we made some progress in the minimum wage area, arguing that this evidence-based approach is useful. I think there's been a little bit of progress in some other key areas. The two that I uh, think about a lot uh, these days are immigration and uh, trade. And in both cases, I think that there's similar problems. The kind of go-to model uh, that at least one set of economists will have when they're thinking about an issue like immigration will be quite different than the go-to model that someone else will have. And uh, that turns out to make quite a big difference, uh, as anybody who follows that debate uh, knows. Um, and th the same thing is true with trade. Now it's become, I think, increasingly clear from very careful empirical studies largely following the framework of the kind of studies that Alan and I tried to do with the minimum wage. In other words, we have a set of places that are impacted by trade reforms and another set that aren't. We've got a treatment group and a control group. Let's follow what happens. Has suggested that our understanding of the costs of trade reforms have, have, were substantially underestimated by kind of the simple uh, go to the blackboard, draw a little picture, and make a policy analysis out of that picture. So I think that hopefully that going forward, that a stronger emphasis on evidence-based uh, policy discussions can, can be the, the long run uh, contribution of our work. And I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Well, I'm very happy to be able to comment on this, uh, this work and partner with Heather and, and Ben uh, in putting this on. Um, Alan and David are both uh, really good, decent guys who have done really great research on this topic. But their body of work even beyond this is really, um, really quite awesome. And, um, you know, either one of them could have retired at age 40 and had been really important people in the, the field of labor economics. And um, so this is just one, one of the key areas. Uh, first, I want to comment on the impact of the book and the research leading up to it on, on research in labor economics. Um, in two areas, just to point it out. Um, one is methodology, and, and they're sort of referring to it, but they really highlighted the whole, let's try to find natural experiments. They weren't the first ones. They, they note in the introduction, which I, I read again last night, and it is very well written, um, you know, that it, it, it was happening in some other fields, but they really, I think this really popularized it, and it became, I mean, it's almost like, that's all that grad students are doing now, trying to find natural experiments. And um, they really propelled that forward. Uh, but something else that's quite admirable is that um, they really they went out and collected their own data. They did their own survey. I mean, the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, that's not, they didn't get that from the Department of Employment in New Jersey and the Department of Employment in Pennsylvania. They went out and did a survey of 400 restaurants. Um, and that, you know, and, and, and they both have done that continuing after that with developing new data. And I think that's really quite, uh, quite remarkable and, and left quite an imprint. Uh, it's also interesting to note 
when I look into the book, that they also made their data available on the internet at the with the with the book, which is also now. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure that was the way things were done then. But so it was really kind of a leading thing. With FTP. With FTP, yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah. They said it was going to be available up through the end of 2000. <laughs> so you're okay. You're okay. You're okay. We still get requests. Um, so it has a really big impact uh, on on our field in terms of just how we do research and how we and the approach. Um, it's also had a big effect on on the profession in terms of what it believes about uh, the minimum wage. Uh, Alan noted, but uh, didn't really give the results of the survey recently done by the Booth School about what was the effect, what, what, what are the, ex uh, you know, they have 40, whatever, 50 uh, elite uh, NBR economist um, type economists, uh, who, um, and they asked them what would be the effect on employment of a $15 minimum wage. And 25%, uh, roughly 25% said uh, it would uh, not have a, a, a substantial adverse employment effect. 25% said it would, and 36% said, I don't know, it's uncertain. And I think that, you know, that would not be the way the answer would have been, uh, you know, 25 years ago. Uh, just in my own experience, um, from time to time uh, at EPI, we do sign-on letters of economists. And we were asked to do one about the uh, 10 10 minimum wage. Now, I never talked to these guys about it because Alan won't sign anything. I think neither one of these guys are willing to sign letters like that. But I can tell you that when I circulated the uh, letter on 10 10 to a lot of Nobel Prize winners, uh, some of them said, I will sign this even though I won't sign in many other fields of work because I feel confident about what we know. And uh, so I got really a great pick up of people willing to sign on, and I think that's um, important. So that, this part of my discussion about the profession, I, I have labeled here the good, the bad, and the ugly. That was the good. Uh, the bad and the ugly, it's kind of been referred to here, but there was almost a response that was, um, you know, telling the faithful that their God didn't exist. How can you say that the man curves don't slope downwards? I heard that said by, was it Finest Welsh or someone at the AEA, you know, and, uh, you know, it was really like you were attacking some fundamental uh, belief system and people responded sort of like the Crusades. And, um, uh, and, and, that, and that was a very, had a very scarring effect on, I think, um, I mean, not only on Alan and David, but I think on other people who observe, you know, saying something controversial could lead you to, um, you know, get that kind of response. And, you know, that's not so good for uh, people being willing to um, do research that comes up with an alternative uh, conclusion. I mean, as it is economics, like other social science, like other fields, <coughs> people tend to like to get along and they don't want to rock the boat. So this was, a not, you know, so there's a natural default of not rocking the boat. And this just reinforces that. And then you have institutions referred to, um, this is on, on video, but I'll still say it's the evil EPI, the Employment Policies Institute, which was set up by the fast food franchise uh, industry, uh, you know, responded in full force, they did their own survey, follow-up, I forget all the details. It was a little bit kooky and, but you know, they really uh, responded in force. And um, you know, that's something that we're more used to now in, 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 in the debate on public policy. But that was clearly a kind of a special case then. So um, the, the good news is that people actually did change their mind. And the bad news is, it's not so easy to um, go through this process, and some people won't change their mind. Um, last, let me just say that it had a profound effect on the Economic Policy Institute, uh, in part because 
there was such a controversy, uh, and I think Alan and David um, were a little hesitant to um, uh, get into the mud with the uh, some of their opposition. Uh, my economists uh, had to fill the role in some way, and so Jared Bernstein and John Schmidt, John Schmidt now of Center for Equitable Growth, uh, had spent a lot of time on the phone with reporters trying to uh, explain these issues and um, articulate matters. Um, we also got more involved in, in part because. Um, Alan, as the chief economist of the Department of Labor, asked us to do some research to update part of the book that related to 1990-91. It was, it was on the, the distributional impacts of the minimum wage. Who, who were the beneficiaries in terms of where they sat in the family income distribution? So we started, um, uh, you know, we, we worked on the updating his tables, basically. We're, we're still doing it. We, we, we do it state by state. In fact, Will Kimball, who's here with me, my staff, is I'm sure is doing that, you know, for various referenda campaign uh, around the country, basically updating, uh, he probably doesn't realize, he's updating uh, tables that are in this book, but that's what he's doing. Um, uh, Alan also helped us even earlier in that, thankfully, to, to start our work with the uh, Akron Orientation Group, which helped fundamentally transform the work we do. So. For that, I owe you a debt of gratitude and uh, et cetera. So it's a steady business, this uh, minimum wage work. Um, there's state campaigns, there's local campaigns. Now the local campaigns, we've even had to switch to the American Community Survey because the CPS uh, is too thin. Um, but let me just close by saying that uh, I want to agree with uh, Alan and David that uh, there has been less change in how people think about how the labor market works. And one of the things I was reminded of um, in reading the introduction about how they really profiled Richard Lester. And I may be one of the few labor economists that very strongly identifies with the institutionalist tradition. Uh, and so Lester is, is a huge uh, name in that field. And so it was really great that they essentially were saying, we're doing this empirical work and uh, it, it, it actually confirms what people who think about things differently uh, we're, we're saying all along. Um, last, there's this, in some ways, the people have taken the lesson of minimum wage doesn't affect employment uh, too much, have overlearned that. And let me just comment on that. One is um, the litmus test for raising the minimum wage or not sometimes is just taken, okay, I'll stop in. 30 seconds. Um, d does it cause a job loss or not? But that's, that's a very partial analysis of, 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 of what, because even, even the people who think the uh, minimum wage causes job loss, would, their estimates would show that it vastly expands the wage income of low wage workers. So any kind of full cost benefit analysis needs to go beyond that. Uh, it's also true that uh, employment loss is just a shorthand for fewer hours worked in the low-wage labor market. And the discussion is frequently, you know, are five million, you know, half a million, three million people never going to see it work again. But that's not how it really works in the labor market, especially a low-wage labor market with a lot of churn. And, um, and the last is that people sometimes take the results that it can apply to any wage level that you want to raise the minimum wage. And that may not be true, and we don't really have enough of the economics. We basically, because politics has not given us the data to run the natural experiments with higher wages, uh, but that may, we may be, uh, a, a science may be able to catch up uh, over the next few years. So anyway, thank you very much for the work. Bye. Okay, so now now the fun begins. I mean, this is all fun, but um, I like the, I like the Q and I the Q and A part. So um, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions out, and I want all of you to be thinking of questions out there in the audience. And um, uh, but a couple of things. I mean, first of all, thank you so much. This is all um, super interesting, and I highly recommend everybody get the book and um, 
I, uh, I reread, I read the preface. I had um, looked at this a while back when we, when we had thought about it, uh, but uh, the preface is also fantastic. So just, you know, the intro is good, the preface is also nice. Um, so, uh, so one thing that I just wanted to note actually before getting into questions is that just especially for those of you who are watching maybe on video is that the Washington, that our center supports um, research and one of the things that we are actually most excited about is funding data um, and data acquisition. And so I would just underscore that the kind of innovative work that led to this book was because of, uh, at that point, young researchers going out and gathering new data um, that actually led to this groundbreaking work. And um, so if you are one of those people that resemble that or want to resemble that, um, we are very interested in um, research projects that get at important questions around equitable growth, but in particular bring new data to these really pressing questions. Um, so that's just my one little plug because somebody somebody mentioned that. Um, so a couple of questions. One, um, so that kind of pivots off of where Larry ended. You know, we're having this national conversation right now about what the federal minimum wage should be. We've got all of these communities out there being like, yes, the fight for 15. We've got Seattle and a bunch of other places. I'm from the Seattle area, so that's the one that springs to mind. Um, a bunch of places doing these very higher, these higher minimum wages. And um, so my first question is, what are your thoughts about having regional minimum wages or minimum wages that are indexed to local labor market conditions as opposed to a national minimum wage? What's the, um, it seems like that could be one, one question that these higher minimum wages bring up. Um, when I take a stab, David can add his views. I guess maybe because of creature of habit, I think our system of having a national minimum wage and then states and local areas that they choose can go above that has worked pretty well. And I think it um, emphasizes that we are one nation. We have one set of standards for what's a minimum level of fairness. Um, and I think the minimum wage is fundamentally a political decision. So I would worry about having rigid regional indexation for that reason. I think the political process is probably more apt, uh, more appropriate to deal with it. Because as I said before, I think at the levels that our political process tends to choose, the minimum wage primarily has a distributional consequence. And I think questions about distribution are best determined through a political process. I, I agree with that. I think. Um, there are a few formulas that have, have been set in the past in various parts of, of, um, of government, for example, the indexing formula for Social Security benefits. And even with the best of intentions, those can become uh, difficult things and they can become very difficult to change later. So there's an inherent inflexibility once you set something up. And it might be for reasons that we don't understand 30, 40 years from now, something that we can't even imagine. So there may be reasons why you wouldn't want to be locked into a system. Um, so I, I totally agree with Alan that the, the idea of having a, a national minimum wage makes some sense uh, and then allowing jurisdictions to go above that. <laughs> um, there are a few countries that are experimenting with different things. The British system is in a way more like what you're talking about, although it this, the minimum wage for London would be much different, you know, if you had this system than, than for the rest of England, for example. And yet they've got a single national minimum wage there. So I think that um, I, I would agree that the, the, the case for having an a, um, institutional setting is, is weak, I would think. That's interesting. Um, that's, that, that is helpful. Um, so the second question I wanted to ask is, one of the things that came out of all three of your comments, and um, especially around evidence-based um, policy making, is you have to have evidence to make the policy, right? So if we think that we're giving policymakers guidance that, um, that we should look at, at places that have done something in order to understand what policymakers should do next, um, you're, you're building in a bit of a path dependency, and you're also building in a sort of backward looking. It makes it hard to make the argument, oh, we should try something new because, well, by definition, that's untested. And um, if we're encouraging them, I work a lot with policymakers, and, and you want to sort of be clear and crisp in your messages if we're saying we want to focus on evidence back to then, sort of say, no, well, this one, we want to go with theory. That can be kind of difficult to navigate. How do we, um, how should we be thinking about the frontiers of policy 
where um, there might be less evidence uh, uh, in our in our policy making. Just what, what advice would you would you give on on sort of the, the unknown questions? How can we think about that? That's a tough one, I know. Well, first of all, I think it's it's surprising to many people how few new ideas there really are. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, in reality, for example, uh, just this week a reporter asked me about um, guaranteed minimum income. And that seemed to him like a whole new idea. He was a younger person. Uh, and uh, there, there was a, there's extensive um, uh, experimental evidence on that from, from the 1960s and 1970s, not just in the United States, but other countries. But in addition, um, so, so that's one answer to that. And the other answer is that in many cases, uh, someone who really understands um, analytically how something works can realize that there's a connection between a policy proposal and something that exists. It might not look the same, it might have different words. So uh, guaranteed income is like an EITC in many respects. So you can, you can uh, oftentimes by creative thinking extrapolate from one uh, piece of evidence to, to another. Now, inevitably that's necessary anyway, so I think that, that, that's, that would be my answer. You know, it's interesting. I think I would give a different answer today than I would have given five years ago before I worked in the uh, administration because uh, five years ago I would have said, um, you know, look, we've got to demand high standards for the evidence and otherwise we just say we don't know. And there were a lot of questions I was asked where I would say the evidence was not necessarily reaching that high standard level. Uh, yet I wanted to give the best answer I could. So I tended to come away a bit more eclectic. And while I still think the method of finding randomized experiments, natural experiments that pretty closely mirror what one would do in the idealized randomized experiment, it's not the only evidence that's available. And what I tried to do in my role as a policy advisor was um, to, I guess, two things. One is, to represent the evidence that was out there and give my take on it. And in some cases, say, the evidence is not as dispositive as I would like. I said that once at a meeting with the president. And uh, he said, when is the evidence in economics ever dispositive? <laughs> and I told him in that case, it was pretty far from the frontier of dispositive. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's what the national security community tries to do, too. And that's what they were instructed after 9-11 to give some sense of how competent one should be in their analysis. Um, and it's also the case, I think, that there are some areas of economics where we can develop models based on available evidence where we could be more confident that this is the best model we have to use to try to extrapolate, as David was saying, uh, to answer those questions. So um, I would say I've kind of strayed from a Josh Angrist um, uh, what's the right word? David will come Straight up with jacket. a good one. <laughs> <Straight jacket. laughs> that's a good one. Um, <laughs> approach uh, to one that's more eclectic. Uh, although if I were you know, to have a hierarchy of what types of evidence uh, I thought was the strongest, I would probably start wearing uh, Josh's straight jacket. That's, that's great. Well, let me open it up to the audience. Um, Sandy? Hi, so there's a lot of focus, I think, on when talking about increasing the minimum wage on the short-term um, costs. What are your thoughts on kind of long-run capital substitution or the potential for that? So that's a topic we only looked at a little bit in the book. We looked at... Um, uh, the opening of McDonald's establishments across states and how that was affected by um, um, minimum wage regulations. And we looked over a long period and tried to assess that. Um, I would say in the last 20 years, there's been a little bit of progress in that. There's a couple of pretty interesting studies using uh, sharp changes in minimum wages to look at investment behavior in European countries. Um, the problem we have in, the, in, in addressing that is as you get further and further from the time the minimum wage is increased, more and more stuff is going on. 
And if one wants to, one can blame, you know, the Vietnam War on the minimum wage or whatever. So you can, you can kind of uh, invent a, a lot of um, explanations and it becomes harder and harder to get really solid evidence on that. But I think, I think there is some accumulation. Yeah, I would uh, say that's a real challenge to look at long run effects. And um, I think it's a fair criticism that we focus mostly on the short run. Now, in the period where we were looking, in the long run, inflation tended to erode the value of the minimum wage. So the incentive for capital substitution, I think, was fairly weak. Um, the fact that we saw basically no short run adjustment, I think, suggested that the long run might also be surprisingly uh, 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 resilient in terms of, uh, in terms of employment. Um, also, the fact that we saw all of these other anomalies suggests that one needs to be a bit more eclectic in thinking about how wages get set. And in a model where you have frictions and companies constantly have help wanted ads, the um, amount of workers who are hired is below the optimal level. And raising the minimum wage reduces turnover, helps companies to fill vacancies, and as long as it's set in the moderate range, could potentially, at some employers, cause employment to rise and capital to rise there as well. I mean, they, they would have the incentive to actually invest more in capital in, in that case. The last thing I would say is, in, in some sense, what motivated us to get involved in this literature was dissatisfaction with the kind of research that was being done. It was mostly time series analysis, where people would relate quarterly changes in employment to the quarterly level of the minimum wage relative to average wages adjusted for, adjusted for coverage. And those time series regressions which dominated the field broke down in the <coughs> 1980s. They broke down as inflation eroded the value of the minimum wage. We didn't see uh, job growth the way that you would have predicted. And statistically significant coefficients became insignificant if you just updated the time series estimates that people had done. Um, now, we were always kind of skeptical of that literature, uh, but I actually thought, I was taught the textbook model and it probably would hold, so we looked for better ways of testing that. Um, but if you go back to those time series studies and play around with lags, you don't see bigger effects in the long run than in the <laughs> short run. And as David said, it becomes much harder. It's harder with natural experiments. It's even harder with time series data, even though some people make their living doing that. And I would say there's just not much evidence that that takes place, and there are probably sound theoretical reasons uh, that uh, flow from our findings that suggest that there shouldn't be much capital substitution in the long run either. Other questions? Hi, um, I'm uh, Mark Levinson from Service Employees Union. Um, I have a, actually a comment and a question. Uh, I read the new uh, preface, which is really great. The, the quote from James Buchanan I thought was you know kind of worth the price of the new book itself. Um, but you, you, you have a section in there called, Can the Minimum Wage Be Too High? This is the comment part of the, And it, um, it contrasts greatly, I think, with an op-ed that Alan Kruger wrote a few months ago you know, in the New York Times, where um, in the op-ed, you, know, you came out against a $15 an hour minimum wage, arguing it was a risk um, not worth taking, uncharted waters, etc. In the book, which I think we have to consider the more complete, the more nuanced, the more careful uh, view, you do not come out against a $15 uh, an hour minimum wage. In fact, you're very, um, you know, you say even if the minimum wage exceeds that level, referring to $15 an hour, it will still increase total earnings for low wage workers if the elasticity of demand is less than one in uh, absolute value. Um, so given that, I don't know, probably several million people read your op-ed piece and presidential candidates are citing it you know, on the campaign, you seem to take a different view here. So, so one, you know, is that true? But this, the, the question is, um, and this kind of gets to Larry and, and Heather's comment, uh, what should be the criteria about setting a minimum wage. 
it, should it be the level which you know uh, produces minimal you know job loss you know or you know should it be in the language of the Fair Labor Standards Act you know the importance of maintaining of you know minimum standard of living necessary for the health efficiency and general well-being of workers and how you you know kind of re you know relate those two I think is you know very important and the minimum wage debate to date has been way you know as Larry and Heather I think way too uh, focused on the uh, you know, underplaying the certain possible, the certain benefits, you know, as opposed to the uncertain possible, you know, costs. So your thoughts on that? Well, thanks for the question. Um, I think the preface is pretty consistent with what I wrote in the New York Times piece. Um, for a couple of things. I mean, you uh, said the book didn't address the $15 an hour minimum wage. When we wrote that preface, $12 an hour was kind of where uh, most of the proposals for a federal minimum wage were. Uh, and that was, um, at the time, I think, considered to be on the high side. The statement that you read, that if the elasticity is less than one, then total payroll rises, that's certainly correct. And that's consistent with what I wrote in the New York Times piece. Um, what I think we say in the, uh, 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 in the preface is uh, that in the ranges that we've seen for minimum wages, uh, the weight of the evidence suggests that zero is a pretty good estimate for the employment effect. Um, and if you extrapolate beyond that, at a certain point we point out in the book, you're going to be back on a demand curve. Uh, that would be the case in a... Uh, job search model, that would be the case in a classic monopsony model. Um, and at that point, I think what you quoted is correct. The main uh, consideration, if you think about low wage workers as a whole, is whether the elasticity of demand is less than one. But the public policy considerations are broader than that. And the public policy considerations are still mainly distributional. I think the distributional considerations are easier if there's no efficiency loss. If there is a, an efficiency loss, because you may be past the point of um, having uh, no impact on aggregate employment, uh, then I think that makes the policy decisions much more difficult. Uh, but I think it is still a political decision. So I would view the piece I wrote in the New York Times as somewhat nuanced, in that uh, I feel comfortable, if you want to cite our work, to say there's going to be no impact on employment. $12 is probably the uh, outer end of that range in today's, in today's dollars, looking at where the minimum wage is internationally, looking at where research has been done on the value of the minimum wage. Uh, I think it's the case that if you go beyond that, we are in uncharted waters. People can have different opinions. I didn't say uh, that uh, others could view the risks, this, you know, should view the risks exactly the same, uh, same as me. Um, and on your question about having a minimum standard of living, we don't view the minimum wage in isolation. Uh, we now have a much stronger earned income tax credit than we had when we published the book 20 years ago. Uh, and that combined with the $12 an hour minimum wage, which would be the highest minimum wage in real terms in, in, in our history, uh, I think would be a very significant step towards uh, meeting our, our goal of, um, uh, of setting a floor which is uh, above some minimum threshold. Yeah. Uh, can I ask you, I'm sorry, uh, can I? Hi, uh, can I ask you, how has the labor market for, for low-wage workers changed uh, in the 20 years uh, since the book came out? Uh, I think of the emergence of home health care workers. I also think of the uh, movement of retail to an online distribution from a storefront uh, model. And there's probably several other areas. Uh, and how does that change in the labor market change policy prescriptions? Thank you. So one, one really important area is a decline, massive decline in, in youth employment rates. So basically, teenage, for, for a long period of time, uh, all the research on minimum wage was about teenage employment rates. And teenage employment rate now is below 50%. And seems to be trending down steadily. And there's a variety of reasons for that. Some good, some maybe not as good. Uh, 
But I think these days you don't think of the low-wage labor market as largely populated by teenagers. There just aren't that many teenagers for one thing, and for another thing, they don't have high employment rates. And a lot of parents don't think that they want their kid working. So that whole ethic has changed. Uh, so one really important part is uh, um, immigration. So a big chunk of the low-wage labor market is now immigrants. That really changed from the mid-1990s to today. Um, a second part would be the rise in older workers who've come back and work at, as low-wage workers and second jobs and things like that. So the greeters at Walmart, for example, would be an example. Uh, a third thing would be, as Alan said, the, minim the uh, EITC, expansion of the EITC. Um, a third thing, that, fourth thing that's probably important is very different patterns of, of um, labor or higher rates of participation by um, single mothers so that we've kind of gotten rid of most of the, <laughs> of, the, of the safety net associated with the old TANF system that's essentially no longer functional. We have a more broader um, safety net coming out of the um, SNAP program so that those things are interacting in a way that we didn't see in the 1990s. Those are th some things that come to mind. A, a, a final thing I would say, regional differences are, are at this time, I, my impression is they're bigger now than they've been ever. Um, that, that especially in the youth labor market, but that, that is partially driven by other things. So if you look at the employment rates of children growing up in Appalachia for 15 years, they've been much, much lower, 10 percentage points lower than employment rates of kids growing up in other parts of the country. And we really don't understand exactly what that's about, but it's really part of the story that probably needs to be thought about. Just to add a little bit, when uh, we were doing our work, one of the things that we were actually quite focused on was non-compliance with the minimum wage. And um, the evidence continues that there's a tremendous amount of non-compliance that employers violate the law. One of the reasons why we focused on fast food restaurants and chains was they do obey the law. They have a stronger incentive to obey it because they worry about their reputation and their reputational costs if, if they're found violating the labor laws. And uh, although a lot has changed in the job market, there's more contracting out, which I think is also kind of consistent with some of the themes in our book, uh, in that some of the contracting out, I think, is taking place to avoid sharing the profits with workers and uh, to avoid kind of wage hierarchies and uh, the compression that takes place within, within companies. So if you contract out the low-wage services, uh, you could get away with paying less for them. For that, I think that's kind of consistent with what we were finding in our in our book. Um, but if the um, reasons why the labor market is less competitive than the textbook ideal, uh, because there are frictions in the job market, for example, I think that still applies even with the emergence of these new types of institutions. And uh, I suspect it's still the case that if you looked at where the minimum wage workers are, it's not terribly different. Uh, in terms of the, the types of employers uh, today than uh, when we look back in the early 90s. Yeah, so we want to leave time for, um, for book signings, but I'll take a, a final question. Yeah. One of the most intriguing pieces of research that have come out of the minimum wage stuff is that it seems to be good for employers, and so they seem to be able to hire more productive workers and things like that. But then especially when I'm back in Chicago, when that line of argument comes out, people then ask, well, why don't more employers just do this on their own? Why do we need a minimum wage to force employers to do that? And I'd love to hear your response to that. Well, um, you know, I would say what you said is accurate in terms of some companies find that they can fill their vacancies. Uh, but it's not necessarily good for employers in terms of profitability. Now, I think employers often overreact or a segment overreact because they act as if their competitors are not going to face a higher minimum wage. So they just think, oh my god, I'm going to have to raise wages by 10, 20 percent without recognizing that other employers who they compete with are going to do the same thing. And we found evidence, I read it a little bit more strongly than David has, that prices uh, adjust with a higher minimum wage. But one area where there's been very little subsequent work is on profitability. And in the models that I prefer to use for the job market, uh, I suspect it does affect employer profitability. Um, so from a self-interest point of view, I can see why some employers uh, take the position they do. Many others are more enlightened and look at 
the impact on the economy as a whole. Um, you know, one other thing I kind of think a little bit about in, in terms of the minimum wage, because I'm a bit torn since I have a, a friend who owns many Burger Kings who uh, insists that it affects his bottom line, uh, even though he also points out he can never hire enough workers at the wage that he's paying. Both of those are consistent, I think, with, with the way we view the economy. Um, so I worry a little bit about the, the fairness. On the other hand, given that the value of the minimum wage is so much lower today than it was before, I think you could say just in terms of standards of fairness that we had in the past, uh, these employers are getting a windfall from, from the decline in the real value of the minimum wage. Uh, so I don't think that they're necessarily irrational because I think it does affect their profitability. We tried in the chapter, probably the least read chapter of the book, to look at stock market valuations of firms when you have minimum wage increases. And very recently there's a paper by Steve Machen and co-authors looking at the UK at a more direct measure of profitability. Um, and I, th it's hard to get data on profit. Um, David always had the view, and I you know, take maybe a response you're going to give, uh, that some of the effect could come from land values. And that's another area where I have not seen, seen work since, since uh, I haven't seen work, period, <laughs> before or after our book. So as a small technical point, if, if firms are choosing the wage, uh, then to first order, an increase in the wage has no effect on profits, right? That's a very standard argument. I think Paul Krugman resurrected that in the last few months. So, so there's a, so it's a sort of a second order effect anyway. But it, it, there's, I, I think what Alan said is right. There's absolutely no disconnect between firms on average being able to recruit more workers if you're forcing them to pay a higher minimum wage with the fact that they would actually prefer to have vacancies and a lower wage. That's, that's exactly what this modern class of model says. And that, so, yeah. Can I, I'm gonna ask one follow-up to that that you allude to in the last paragraph in the preface about thinking about, I think it's the last paragraph or maybe second penultimate, um, about demand. Um, one question that we get a lot from um, advocates, especially certain advocates, is questions about how raising the minimum wage um, actually has demand side effects. Um, could you speak to that at all? Well, that's not something we were able to look at in, in our book. And um, uh, I think the evidence does suggest that uh, there could be aggregate demand effects. Um, I mean, Eric asked before what's changed in the last 20 years. We've had tremendous increase uh, in income growth at the very top. Um, and I mean, that was taking place when we wrote our book. We were kind of well aware because it started in the early 80s. Um, really started in earnest in the early 80s, but it's continued. And uh, I think that aggregate demand is being affected by the uh, tremendous skewing of our income distribution. The marginal propensity to consume is just much lower at the top tenth of a percent than it is in the middle or in the bottom 20 percent. And the evidence that's looked at consumption finds bigger effects, frankly, than I would have expected. Um, for example, Dan Aronson has a paper where he looks at what happens when the minimum wage goes up to uh, consumer expenditures and finds that low-income people are much more likely to buy a car, which is kind of leveraging the high, higher wage. Uh, so the marginal propensity to consume could be quite high. Um, and I think especially given the tremendous rise in inequality that we've seen, that's an argument that has more force today than, than 20 years ago. I agree with that, yeah. Awesome. All right, well, with that, um, there are books out for sale. We wanted to give folks time to do some signings. Just thank you so much for joining us and for this work. And can you all join me in a? Thank you.